Shalom, shalom. You're listening to Live Internet Studies. This is episode number 243. My name is Ariel ben Lyman Hanavi. Let's open with a word of prayer. Avinu Malkino, our Father, our King, thank you once again for bringing us to this place where we can connect with one another across the miles via this medium known as the Internet. And we are so thankful that the topics that we study during these times are as far as we can ascertain, they're relevant for not just our everyday lives, but for things that are going to happen in the near future, particularly when we're talking about the eschatology study. And Lord, of course, the other half or the other segment of our study where we talk about Trinitarian topics is always a relevant topic in any day, in any age, no matter when. So thank you, Lord, for these topics. Thank you for the interest that is um, made apparent to me through the YouTube channel, the comments, the, the the views, the clicks, the likes, the thumbs ups, and also the interaction through the other means that I am able to um, uh, interact with the uh uh, the, uh, uh, the iTunes podcasts and things like that. Thank you, Lord, for all of these wonderful yet um, uh, challenging responsibilities that are before me. Uh, continue to help me to have a, a clearer understanding of the topics that I'm discussing. I'm not perfect. I don't have all the answers, but to the degree that I believe the Holy Spirit is revealing things in the Word, then um, I believe I'm responsible, Lord, to share those things with others. And I ask that uh, my viewers and listeners would give me grace since, again, we're all on this learning journey as we work our way through these particular topics. So, um, uh, be with all of us as we uh, continue to press into your word. And to we want to uh, learn of you. We want to know your truths. We want to uh, be of uh, equipped so that we can be ambassadors for your name and um, sharing the gospel with other people that do not yet know that there's only one way, truth, and life that exists in creation. And his name is Yeshua. And he's the only way that we're going to make it during these last end uh, dark days, um, uh, stressful days that are um, uh, before us. So thank you for um, the presence of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for his faithfulness. And Lord, uh, just continue to raise us up and protect us. And we'll be careful to give you the praise and the glory. B'Shem Yeshua. Amen. Thank you, everyone, for joining me during these live internet studies. There are two segments that I always mention that these live one and a half hour studies um, include. The first segment is given over to a study known as eschatology, which is a word that refers to end time events. That's why the study is entitled Eschatology, Biblical Study of End Time Events. We're talking about the events that are going to, according to the futurist model, going to eventually. Uh, be take uh, uh, overtake planet Earth, befall planet Earth was, was the word I was looking for earlier, and we're talking about the second coming of Yeshua, the return of Yeshua, the prosia in the Greek, the, the the arrival of the great King into his city, and the people will go out to meet him. This is kind of an ancient um, Roman and Greek motif or theme that's carried along by many of these scriptures so we've been discussing these certain passages we went all the way back to the old testament and, and worked our way towards this book of revelation uh that we've been using as the kind of the backdrop eventually we'll get to it we're just kind of parked out right now and you chose all of it discourse and we're we're finalizing it i, I which is matthew chapter 24 we're actually Door towards the very end. We might even finish it tonight. Maybe next week. We'll see. This is a study on the book of Revelation eventually. The second half of the live internet studies, the last 30 minutes, is given over to a topic known as a Trinitarian response to biblical Unitarianism, where I've been taking verses that are supplied by biblicalunitarian.com, a non Trinitarian yet Christian denomination that does not espouse to Trinitarian beliefs. They do not accept the incarnation. They believe that Jesus is a human that was born in the first century, and yet he's worthy of worship because God commands it so. So we've been looking at verses that they have been putting forth as so and so-called proof texts that Jesus cannot be very God-veiled in flesh. And right now we're parked out on Proverbs 8, 23 
where wisdom is described in that book, in that chapter, as existing with God, or created or brought forth at the very beginning of God's creation. Is this Yeshua? Is this Jesus? Is it just personification? What's going on in that passage? So we've been looking at that as well. All right, let's turn straight to the eschatology study right now, as we've been doing. As I mentioned, we've been working our way down through Matthew chapter 24, knowing that there are parallel passages, and we'll probably look at a few of those tonight. There's a parallel passage in Mark 13. There's also a parallel passage in Luke 17 and Luke 21. And so we've really been using the Matthew passage as our primary. But as we're moving into a section of verses where Yeshua is going to be warning his disciples about the state of affairs on planet Earth when he returns, he's going to liken it to the days of Noah. And there are some details there that are going to cause us to need to jump through some of the other synoptic versions of this uh, prophecy that he gave to his disciples. Particularly, we will look at um, Mark today and Luke as well. All right, let's just real quick, you can see that on your screen right now, this is the schedule that I've been using for the entire um, study on eschatology. We're in topic number nine, he shows all of it, Discourse Part 2, and we're poised to start really turning eventually into the rapture topic, which is guaranteed, I hope, <laughs> to be a lively discussion since there's so much controversy that swirls around this topic of the rapture, uh, including all of the different rapture views. There's about three or four main rapture views. And then there are a few uh, 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 positions out there that teach that the rapture isn't even something that we should even be looking forward to. Maybe it's um, a figment of our imagination. It's, it's fanciful thinking. It's not really found in Scripture. It's, it's a reading into Scripture. So we'll begin to discuss rapture uh, topics right around the corner. Like I said, either at the beginning of the year or maybe the week after that depends. Okay, so let's jump into our uh, discussion tonight. So, when I look at the passage that we're going to be working our way towards, and I think we're actually already um, uh, parked in, uh, Matthew has a rendering of the Olivet Discourse that shows primarily up in Matthew chapter 24. But earlier in Matthew, in chapter 13 of the same book, there are some words that are given that that parallel the end time sort of uh, details or scenarios Yeshua kind of give gave his disciples a few more um, details that uh, fill in some of the dialogue that didn't show up in the latter part of Matthew so Yeshua isn't uh, Yeshua isn't, doesn't launch into this great long detail about end times but he does talk about his his uh, second coming and he talks about some of the details of what the kingdom of God will be like. And so we're going to use um, part of Matthew 13 uh, when we look at um, the, the relevant passages in the latter part of Matthew. Likewise, I'm just kind of giving you a preview of what we're going to be looking at. Likewise, we're going to look at Mark 13 tonight, where there's a part of the discussion that's similar to the Matthew part. A lot of detail about... Um, Yeshua second coming and things like that and then eventually also tonight we're going to look at Luke 17 because he's not questioned in Luke 17 by the disciples as to when will be the sign of your coming and at the end of the age instead the Pharisees ask him as to when the kingdom of God was coming and so all of these narratives that we find in the Gospels they all have a similar backdrop and so as we um, work our way through these notes uh, we've been using uh, the Enduring Word, uh, Pastor David Guzik's com commentary here that you can see on my screen, Matthew 24, Jesus, all of the discourse. And so um, I've been borrowing those notes, and I think they're quite helpful. Um, I recommend them. I put a little link in my description in the video below, uh, below the YouTube video, EnduringWord.com, where he's got a Bible commentary on each and every verse in the Bible, and it's available for free. And although I don't agree with everything um, that Pastor Guzik teaches, for instance, he is, in terms of rapture views, I believe he's a classic pre-millennial, pre-tribulationist, i.e. he believes in a thousand-year millennial kingdom that will be established here on planet Earth and that Jesus will return bodily to planet Earth to set up this kingdom. So that's what he means by pre-millennial. Pre meaning Jesus returns before the millennium 
is uh, set up and established or commences. And yet, pre-trib, pre-tribulation, means that he believes in the classic dispensational version of a seven-year tribulation where there are seven years of intense hardship and trials on planet Earth that are to be equated with the wrath of God being poured out on wicked humanity, and yet the church will be raptured seven years prior to, well, at the beginning of the seven years or sometime before that seven years, uh, un questionable time before we don't know exactly when things like that so uh nevertheless these are the notes we've been borrowing but um let me look at some uh others okay all right so let's begin to uh uh, work our way through some of these um passages let me show you the main relevant passage right here that the section that we're in in matthew i'll read that then i'll jump back into uh verse uh, chapter 13 and through some of the other synopsis and show you why we're going to be talking about these topics so matthew 24 starting in verse 36 we're going to read down through verse 41 this is our segment segment for tonight and i believe we can get through most of this and we'll see what happens so yeshua says to his disciples but speaking of his return slash rapture second coming and i'm i'm introducing a a couple of different terms because on the one hand in the broadest of strokes there's one second coming that i'm aware of in the bible yeshua returns to planet earth once and ultimately the big theme is to um uh bring in the final of uh, judgments against humanity wicked humanity to bring israel to a place of repentance and to establish his kingdom remember way back in daniel 9 24 through 27 daniel was given a, a broad overview of end times as well where where um the vision that he had the dream that he had was interpreted as that there are these 70 weeks of seven seven year periods that will mark off eventually god dealing with israel and with the rest of humanity and 69 of those sevens have come and gone already and now we're waiting for this final seventh if you're a futurist you're waiting for this final seven years and in that final seven years those broad themes were outlined in daniel as something to the effect of uh you know, uh, cleansing the temple, bringing a uh, sealing of uh, the vision and prophecy, uh, bringing in everlasting righteousness, anointing the most holy. So there's there's some details that I'm not I'm I'm just vaguely um, recalling. I'm not specifically telling you. If you want to go back and read on your own, Daniel 9, 24, 25, 26, 27, read that on your own. But the point I'm trying to highlight is that in that broad picture, we see one arrival of the son of man going all the way back to daniel 7's vision where it's the son of man that approaches the ancient of days which itself goes all the way back to the daniel chapter 2 vision where it's the stone cut without hands that strikes the statue at the toe stage and that stone that strikes the statue is this everlasting kingdom that god brings in that will never ever pass away it will not like the other kingdoms prior to that be overthrown by a successive kingdom like we saw in the statue of the 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 head and the shoulders and the belly and then the thighs and then the toes the feet well all of those kingdoms kind of come and go because they're led by human beings they're led by mere um nations who are not the son of man but when god brings in his everlasting kingdom which is that stone which is cut without hands obviously that's a reference to yeshua well then that's the kingdom that's going to last forever so that's what we're working towards that is the baby that's going to be born in yeshua's birth pings analogy as it were the day of the lord which brings in the kingdom and i'll show you a chart eventually that matches what i'm showing talking about i'm just right now i'm just giving you the broad overview so let's read this uh, part of Matthew and uh, dialogue with it and see how there are some important parallel uh, details that are given in other parts of the Bible that will help us better understand what we're reading here in Matthew. <coughs> Yeshua says, starting in verse 36, I'll just read the whole thing first. But about that day and hour, speaking of his second coming, or, here's where I was kind of going with that, I'll go ahead and tip my hand a little bit, um, otherwise it might not make sense. Speaking of that day and the hour, he is talking about his second coming, yes, but I believe that 
we could make a strong case, and this is the hermeneutic principle that I've been going with, that when we look at the second coming of Yeshua, that we're also talking about the day of the Lord in general, which is a time frame on the calendar that fits inside of the 70th week, and yet doesn't uh, take up all of the 70th week. So we've got the day of the Lord inside, and you know what, I should start showing you some charts, otherwise this is, gonna, this is not going to make much sense to some of you. All right, so let's just show you some charts. So in this first chart, which we've been used to looking at, we've got, this is the 70th week of Daniel. Uh, again, zoomed out. All seven years are seen in front of us here, uh, neatly divided between the three and a half on one side and three and a half on the other side, left and right. We've got the seals running along the bottom, which correlate with the parallel details given in Revelation chapter 6 and chapter 7. So those are the seals down at the bottom. But the seven-year time frame was given by Daniel way back in chapter starting oh well, i mean like i said it's we it depends on where you start in daniel chapter 2 chapter 7 chapter 9 and then read through the end of the book of daniel all of the 70th seventh week of daniel is 70th week of daniel is is foretold in in those different dreams that he had the point i'm trying to highlight is that we've got some major events on this seven year last seven years of this age this olam hazeh this this um the, the current age the present age and we've got on the far left, Antichrist makes a covenant with Israel. That's the beginning of the 70th week. But notice at the end of the 70th week, with that yellow arrow pointing off to the right, Jesus' reign in Jerusalem begins. So, to some degree, that's the broad overview. Antichrist on the far end, on one end, Jesus Christ, the true Christ, on the other end. And yet, the yellow arrow itself signifies this time known as the Day of the Lord, which commences with the seventh seal, but it's signified by the sign given in the sixth seal. And the separator between the Day of the Lord and the other part of the chart is the uh, rapture itself, or the snatching away aka the resurrection of the saints that's also prophesied uh in other places so that's the broad overview but as i begin to look at some other charts here that we've used in the past we notice that yes there are three and a half years on one end and three and a half years on the other end and we've got the pre-wrath rapture at least according to the view that i hold to and the second coming kissing each other right there by those black and white arrows pointing up and down consecutively or, or next to each other and then we got god's wrath and day of the lord on the far right of the chart Notice though that when we've got the day of the day of the Lord, the book end at the beginning of the of the day of the Lord is the rapture slash second coming slash one aspect of the resurrection. And yet, as we're gonna find out, that on the other end, the the right side of the day of the Lord, is actually another book end of wait are you ready for it? The second coming. So, my understanding is that there's not two second comings, there's one second coming, and yet it is divided between the two bookends at the very broadest stroke. There might even be some other uh, itinerary events even between that, where Yeshua touches down, and we'll talk about those in time. But for now, I'm, I'm still painting kind of broad strokes. A rapture on one bookend, where the uh, beginning of the day of the Lord is is, commences and a second coming on the right side of the day of the lord the farthest right of this chart that you're looking at that signals the second coming so or that that signals the body re, bodily return so if i were to begin to look at maybe a few more what we're talking about is that three and a half years occurs many times in the book of revelation but it correlates with the um, 1260 days already spoken about by Daniel, as well as the 42 months that are mentioned in Revelation a few different places. And so, uh, when we begin to examine what these uh, times represent, these three and a half years, many times they're talking about the second half, meaning the part that contains the Great Tribulation, as well as the Day of the Lord. And yet, it's three and a half plus three and a half that equals seven. And yet, we read in Daniel that there are an extra set of days even extending past the seven years. So let me look at one other chart. And this one might be a little more difficult to see because it looks quite busy. But if you bring your eye down to the bottom part of the chart where there's some kind of olive-colored green um, part, you'll notice that it says three and a half years, 1260 days. And then 
midpoint, and then three and a half years, 1260 days, kind of an olive green there. And then immediately below that, there's a kind of a lighter green that says Daniel 70th week, 70 years. But notice as you keep drawing your eye down a little farther into the chart, there's a kind of a, what is that, a pastel purple that says 30 days. And then it's marked also as 2,300 days in total. And yet then below that, there is a 1,290 days below that also in kind of pastel purple. And then even farther at the bottom of the chart, there's a dark kind of charcoal gray that says 1,335 days. And again, it's a reference from Daniel. Hard to see on this chart, but if you have to pause the video and zoom in a little bit, then that could be helpful. So what's the point? Is that even though we've got seven years of this final seven-year rebellious um uh, time period that mankind has been allowed to kind of uh, vent his anger and frustration at God, wave his angry fist at God, and reject God, God's Messiah, God's word, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, the truth. God says, "Go ahead and do all you want, mankind. You're gonna, you, you're, you're going to be punished, and I'm gonna pour out my punishment on you. And it's the day of the Lord. That's the punishment in the second half of this seven years, the second half of the three and a half of the two three and a half year slices. It's the second half, the one on the right side." Um, the kind of the gray part where you see the white horse and things like that. It's marked out as the day of Lord on this chart. God says, go ahead and do all you want because I'm going to pour out my judgment on wicked humanity. I'm going to pour out my judgment on Satan's evil kingdom, his eighth beast empire that's going to rise up during this time, the new world order that would be in, in, uh, in place during this time. Go ahead and do whatever you want. I'm going to have my final say, and yet I'm also going to bring Israel to her knees during this time. But before I pour out my wrath, God says, I'm going to rapture the church, and yet then I'm going to send my son back, and he's going to establish the everlasting kingdom that, that I've given to him, but starts with the millennial reign, the thousand years on the farthest right of the chart. So the point I'm trying to show is that we've got the seven years, but we've also got these extra 30 days at the end of the chart, and then an extra 45 days after that 30 days, also at the end of the chart. So there are, there are some other events where the wrath of God, the day of the Lord, isn't filled up in the last three and a half years it spills out over into the 30 into the 45 and so um as we look at a different chart we can see it this way we've got this is really a really broad view of all the 70 weeks of daniel but notice uh on the chart there's a cross that begins what we call the church age which is a kind of a i don't know what is that a a kind of a grapefruit colored not a kind of a not really red but kind of a pinkish it's dead center in the middle of the chart where it says church age and then if you follow to the right reading from left to right we've got the bright red part that's labeled the tribulation this particular view of the chart is not a pre-wrath view it is a pre-trib view so it's got the rapture occurring right at the beginning of the seven year tribulation a term that i do not identify with as the full seven years of being tribulation but notice at least on this chart we've got the three and a half years and the three and a half years um signifying the seven year slice and then at the end of the seven year we've got the second coming in armageddon so this chart also does what i've been um purporting it separates the rapture as one book end of the second coming of christ and the second coming itself proper as the other bookend two bookends one event one second coming not two second comings one second coming one parousia and yet separated by the rapture on the left side and the second coming proper on the right side and then this ushers in of course there's our uh, some more um kind of a greenish light greenish or whatever almost a teal color there thousand year kingdom age and then we've got the great white throne judgment on the farthest right with the new heaven and the new earth so again, just using some more charts, here's another one that does similar, three and a half years, three and a half years. But notice um, on that seven year period, looking kind of at the bottom of the chart, we've got this 1260 days for the rule of the prince, and then we've got 1290 days until the destruction of the prince, and then 1335 days until the rule of Christ, which then ushers in the kingdom. The whole point of these charts that I'm showing you now, which are new charts that I hadn't showed you in the past, unless you've been following my study from way back, then I briefly showed them to you. I'm showing these to you because we're working our way towards beginning to talk about the rapture, which goes by a few different names. The second coming, the prosia in Greek, the 
um, uh, uh, the, the return of Christ the, 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 in those days. And what we're going to begin to see is that the Bible simply describes many times simply one second coming, but it's difficult to see that there's a rapture on, on one part of that second coming and then the second coming proper. In fact, there are many Bible teachers who believe that the rapture and the second coming are the same event meaning there's no real rapture it's just that the bible's describing it as one event with no break between them and yet i believe that the bible does give us some some duration some time frame between the front book end and the back book end there must be some events that take place uh during those times and i believe it's based on a base basically a literal um hermeneutic that follows not just the book of revelation literally uh as best as it can kind of chronologically but also um factors in that daniel should be read um when i say literal i mean we're talking about chronologically i don't mean that the beasts are really going to be beasts and things like that i mean to the degree that we can take it at face value with its um chronology that's what i mean by literal a uh, few more charts just real quick here's another chart that shows that there are two events the rapture on the left side the second coming on the right side and some of the differences between um these two events which are really one event but two bookends so i don't want you to get confused i'm not teaching that there are two second comings of christ rather i'm teaching there's one second coming but the term second coming which is what the bible uses because the word rapture isn't actually found in the bible unless you get to go from the latin into the english then we start finding the word rapture itself but in the original greek there's no rap word rapture but we're talking about two bookends of one return of messiah so we'll get to this in time where we begin to look at i just kind of parked it out in here so you can see kind of uh, um kind of scan with your eyes some of the differences between the two which is what leads many bible teachers to believe that they might be either the same event even though there are different things that happen but maybe some bibles believers teach that hey maybe one happens immediately and then the other one happens right after the other or something like that few more uh here's one that i pulled uh, um from um the john Bank anchorberg show video uh which was a really good show on the differences between the rapture and the second coming of christ christians are taken the wicked are left the second coming of christ the wicked are taken and the christians are left and this is really going to bear relevance to the passage that we're about to read here where yeshua talks about two will be in the field one will be taken one will be left etc etc and then a final um chart which is uh i suppose i should move that over uh, which is similar to the one we just looked at rapture on the left side second coming on the right side and it's basically the same uh, chart that we just looked at a moment ago where it shows some of the differences between the rapture and the second coming which in my understanding highlights the fact that they're two different events okay so having said that as the kind of teaser part and don't worry we are going to turn headlong into this topic of rapture when we get to topic 10 which is the next topic on my chart let's jump back over to matthew all right let's read what yeshua says and work our three way through some of the notes matthew 24 starting at verse 36 but about that day and hour no one knows so what day and hour is he talking about on the one hand there is the reason why i showed the charts on the one hand he's talking about his second coming because the disciple asked the question, when will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? They didn't say when will be the sign of the rapture, and then when will be the sign of the beginning of the day of the Lord, and then when will be the sign of your second coming, etc., etc., etc. They didn't ask that. They they gave a very broad overview, and Yeshua gives details that seem to culminate in his second coming, but he doesn't exactly say which one is the rapture and which one is the second coming. It's almost like he speaks about them as if they're one event or one large event, which on the one hand they are when you zoom out. It's one second coming, which makes sense according to what their question was. And yet at the same time, he begins to give details that if you begin to think about it logically, he's talking about an event that where he says, no man knows the day or the hour, not even the angels of heaven, nor the son, nor but the father alone. But then if you look at one of these charts, let's see which one i want it to focus on um let's just pick on this chart for a second if you look at this chart you'll notice that it, when yeshua says no man knows the day or the hour and you have to look at the chart this is chart is heavily influenced by daniel's prophecies we've got the covenant on the signed with israel on the far left with the antichrist then we've got the seven year slice running down the bottom the seven year period broken up to three and a half three and a half years divided neatly down the middle 
between the abomination of desolation and the um, Antichrist turning on Israel at the midpoint of the week. So that's a, a neatly prophesied three and a half year time frame. But notice, starting at the middle point and going right, right, reading from left to right, so going uh, in that direction on the chart, at that point in time, Daniel prophesies, or Daniel was given the details that there would be 1260 days given to the rule of the prince, i.e. the little horn of Daniel, i.e. the Antichrist. He has been promised by God that he would be given this 1260 days to wreak havoc on planet Earth. At the same time, Daniel was also told that there would be an additional 30 days beyond the Antichrist rule, not necessarily the destruction of the Antichrist, but at least um, 30 days beyond, so another month past his primary rule, until the destruction of that Antichrist. So he doesn't meet his end until the 30 days uh, after. He's neutered. He's neutralized, as it were. Neutered. Yeah, that's kind of funny, right? Like, he's as if he's an animal, which he is, right? He's a beast. He's, he's neutralized um, after the 260 days, but he's not destroyed until after the 1290 days. But then there's an additional 45 days after the 1260 days. Uh, or after the 1290 days, uh, which gives us a total from the beginning of 1335 days until the rule of Christ, which then ushers in the kingdom. So here's the here's the question that we kind of teased ourselves with last week. If Yeshua says no one knows the day or the hour, then how come Daniel was given at least the days up until the time when, are you ready for it? Yeshua's second coming. So we have one or one of two answers at least. One, either Yeshua wasn't referring to a second coming when he said no man knows the day of the hour. Perhaps Yeshua was referring to a different event that was known as, you ready for it? The rapture. <laughs> that might be one way of looking at it. That's a strong precision position that I'm gonna hold to. But another thing is that perhaps Yeshua was overruling Daniel, right? He was overriding Daniel. He said, yeah, Daniel knew right up until the day when the kingdom would be ushered in. Daniel knew right up until the day when Messiah would be established and uh, and return to planet Earth bodily. But I'm, I'm since I'm the son of man himself, I'm going to tell you that actually Daniel wasn't really quite right. No one really truly knows the day they are. So that's the bit of the, remember David Guzik calls it, this is a bit of a, of a um, dilemma. Is that how may, how can no man know the day of the hour? And yet Yeshua, um, and yet Daniel was given the day and the hour. And then the other thing that we're going to begin to see is that when Yeshua gives all these details in Matthew about no one knowing the day of the hour, um, he then begins to warn uh, people um, that uh, uh, there will be uh, chaos, just like in the days of Noah. I'm sorry, there will be peace, a, a sense of business as usual. In the days of Noah, just like it was in the days of Noah, people eating and drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage, which gives us a sense that everything is going on as normal, business as normal, as it were, as if there was nothing really unusual happening in the world. And then suddenly the rapture happens and everyone's caught off guard. And yet, as we begin to keep reading down through the passages, he and we we um, compare this to other things that we've already learned about this time period. There will be complete and utter chaos going on, right? Tribulation and and birth pains and and earthquakes and and uh, famines and uh, all kinds of other things happening in the world. And right up into the very end, there will be this intense persecution from the Antichrist because of his uh, intense hatred for Israel, his intense hatred for true believers. Right? He will be pouring out his wrath. This will be the time of the great tribulation. The time of of distress, not just on the world, but upon Jacob, a distress so bad that other places Yeshua talked about, this will be a time marked out by tribulation that was never ever seen on planet Earth, no, nor shall ever be again. And so, are you listening to the contrasts? On the one hand, Yeshua told his disciples, this will be a time of great distress, such as the earth has never ever witnessed. And at the same time, he says, for as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage until the days that Noah entered the ark. Meaning, business as usual? So, we've got these kind of two almost contradictory concepts going on. We've got 
great distress, great tribulation, the wrath of Satan being poured out, Israel under intense pressure, being persecuted, being told to flee, to get out, because uh, the Antichrist has great wrath, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and yet Yeshua says it will be kind of business as usual? I mean, that's really strange, right? Okay, and so we've got some odd kind of, they almost appear to be contradictions that are all taking place all at the same time. But let's keep reading Yeshua. So about that day and the hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. Is he talking about the rapture, or is he talking about the second coming? If he's talking about the rapture, this seems to make sense. Because the rapture is an unknown, un it's not even really talked about in the Old Testament. Although resurrection is, right? Resurrection is found in the Old Testament. Um, goes way back. And so it would have been made it would have made sense for the New Testament participants, such as the disciples, to have been kind of privy to Old Testament concepts such as resurrection. Right? It even shows up in Daniel. At that time, uh, many people will awake, some uh to everlasting righteousness, others to everlasting shame. Well, resurrection is that picture that's foretold in the Old Testament, in the Tanakh. And yet Paul when he writes the letter to the Thessalonians, he says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. I think it's the Thessalonian letters there. It might be the Corinthian parallel where he's talking about, We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Or um, uh, the, the Lord will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel. It might be, I, sometimes I get those two verse, those two passages, confl I conflate them in my mind, unfortunately. Because they're, they're both resurrection passages. I think it's 1 Corinthians 15 that I'm talking about. And so, if you think about it, we've got the... Um, We've got the uh, resurrection, which is the rapture, and yet Paul says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. So if you remember this term mystery, which is the Greek word mysterion, in the Bible, mysteries are those truths that were hidden from humanity in the Old Testament in the form of simply um, foreshadows and types and shadows and things like that to be revealed only when the, at the time when Yeshua came to planet Earth. All right, uh, just real quick, those who are in the live class with me, looks like we've got some new people uh, jumping in, which is always a good thing. But just to remind everyone, um, if you're joined in the live Skype class right now, be sure to mute your microphone so that the um, outside noises aren't being carried over into the rest of the class. So I appreciate that. Thank you, everyone, by the way, for joining us uh, for these live studies. Uh, my name is Arwin Lyman Hanavi, and we're studying eschatology, a biblical study of end-time events. So Yeshua says no one knows the day or the hour, and this is an event that I believe is referring to the rapture. And yet at the same time, Paul says that this is something that was a mystery. And so it would make sense that the rapture is difficult to see in the Old Testament, and yet the resurrection is not difficult to see. But the part that I believe, and we'll get to it in time, I'm getting ahead of myself, we'll get to it when we turn to the rapture topic in uh, topic 10. The part that Paul describes as a mystery about the resurrection, I believe, is the fact that the living believers will have their bodies changed rather than the uh, those who are dead having their bodies resurrected. So it's one thing to have a dead body that's brought back to life. That part was foretold in the Old Testament. But the fact that in Messiah, those of us who are still alive when Yeshua returns are going to be changed in the twinkling of an eye where we the incorruptible, the corruptible body will put on incorruption um, and we will be changed, right? It's the famous passage that's over many uh, Baptist nurseries where it says we shall we will we shall not all sleep but we shall all be changed right speaking of babies obviously changing their diapers and sleeping and things like that so we shall not all sleep but we shall all be changed paul is speaking of not just dead in christ believers that will be resurrected but he's also talking about we who are alive at the return of christ will be caught up to meet christ in the air with those who have already been resurrected and thus we'll all be together with the lord so that's the mystery part is the part i believe about the living believers having their bodies changed that part wasn't told foretold in the old testament the resurrection of the saints was so what does that have to do with the day that no one knows the the day or the hour well yeshua says no one knows this day or the hour not in the angels of heaven nor the son but the father alone i believe he's talking about the rapture otherwise if he's talking about his second coming well then daniel at least knew about the timing of the second coming right down to you ready for it not the hour but the day he knew the day yeah why because it's foretold in his prophecy so that's what a good indicator in my understanding why he, Yeshua was talking about the rapture here.
And then he says, for the coming of the Son of Man will be like the days of Noah. So the language about the second coming and the rapture are are um, one and the same type of language, especially when we're talking about the second coming, because it's one Christ, one second coming, and yet it's broken up into um, kind of itinerary parts of a bookend here and then a bookend on the far end. And there's even some stuff in the middle there that we'll get to in time between the bookends. But let's just l use the broad strokes for now. For the coming of the Son of Man will be like the days of Noah, just like the days of Noah. For as in those days, we're reading through Matthew 24, 38. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. Notice it also says to the day. If you go back and read the Genesis account, starting in Genesis chapter 6 and go through about chapter 8, where God has given the details to Noah. At the very beginning, where God begins to warn Noah about the impending doom and the coming flood, God does not give Noah very many details other than that, I'm going to flood the earth, all wicked, all humanity's wicked, and but I'm going to save you and your wife and your sons and their wives. And he tells Noah in advance, basically, hey, guess what? You're going to have some kids and they're going to get married and they're going to have wives and um, you're going to all be saved. So Noah didn't even have kids at the time when God started telling him the broad overview. But as you read through Genesis 6 through 7 and 8, at strategic points in the narrative, God begins to give Noah more and more details as it gets closer to the time when the flood is actually going to begin and it's going to start raining. He starts giving more and more details until finally, when the ark is built and the animals are on board and Noah and his family are on board, the narrative tells us that God shut the door behind Noah and then the rain commences and then the people realize, the people on the outside of the ark realize that we are in trouble. So that's why it says up until the day that Noah entered the ark. So they were clueless, but that's, <coughs> excuse me, that's the general sense of wicked humanity that does not have a clue. Remember, there's two themes, there's two groups of people. Who is it that doesn't know the day or the hour, and who is it that is, is clueless as to what's going on? It's wicked humanity. Yeshua talks about how that people are going to be like a, that his second coming is going to be like a thief in the night. Well, according to which people group is it going to be like a thief in the night? Who will be taken by guard? The answer is those who are not prepared. Remember, we're, if we were to continue reading through Matthew 24 and jump into 25, eventually Yeshua's going to give us a parable of the ten virgins, five wise, five foolish. The bridegroom who returns to meet the bride um, comes at a time at an hour when the bride is not aware. And yet, the whole point of the parable is that the bride needs to be uh, watching and waiting. So we have 10 foolish virgins who don't have enough oil and they don't trim their lamps to meet the bridegroom. And then we have the, the 10 wise virgins who did have oil and they trimmed their lamp because they were waiting, they were ready. And so in that parable, it's a kind of a contrast between those who are waiting for Yeshua to return and those who are not, those who are lazy and are, are not waiting for our Lord to return. They're not waiting for the bridegroom. This could symbolize either um, reprobate huma uh, humanity on the broad end or it could represent um, apostate Christianity, people who are Christian in name only, that are not really ready for our Lord. So either way, that category of people is in the dark. They are in the darkness. They are taken by surprise at the arrival of the bridegroom, and therefore they are not ready. And so they don't know the day or the hour. They don't know anything. They're clueless. And this corresponds with some of the other parables that Yeshua gives about the the um, uh, the the owner of the field who goes on a long journey and he leaves the people in charge, and yet then they are not uh, waiting for their master to return, and so they're lazy and and they're just goofing off. And then the master comes and finds them and cuts them in half with a whip, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so, yet, so he begins to work through these parables. And so we have to begin to realize, where are you on this chart uh, that I'm describing of two different people groups? Are you on the side of the wicked and reprobate humanity, which also includes, sadly, apostate Christianity and apostate Israel, people who are just not ready. They're not waiting for God. They're not waiting for Yeshua's return. They're not looking for any day of the Lord. They're not looking for any activity from heaven as to... Um, and that might interrupt their daily affairs. They're just going on with business as usual, even though the world is falling apart all around them with the tribulation and the the the, the, the um all of the wrath of Satan, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you have that group on one hand. On the other side, we've got people who are watchful, who are ready, who are diligent, who've got their 
uh, oil in their lamps and they're, uh, uh, they're, 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 they're waiting for the Lord's return. They're diligent servants. They've been waiting for their master to, to, to come back, um, et cetera, et cetera. They are children of the light, to borrow Paul's terminology in the Thessalonian letters. They're not children of the darkness. There's a contrast between people on one side of this chart and people on the other side of this chart. And the reason I'm highlighting it is because it begins to help us understand Yeshua's warnings about no one knows and uh, the state of affairs in the world and things like that. Let's keep reading. Uh or as in those days before the blood, they were eating and drinking, etc., etc. And now we're down to verse 40. At that time, there will be, notice this, two men in the field. And again, we've only got two contrasts. One will be taken and one will be left. And then verse 41, two, men will be, two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and one will be left. When we get to the Luke passage, we're going to find that there's also two men in one bed. One will be um, uh, taken and one will be left. This is not any type of strange scenario where he's talking about homosexuality to men it just means two humans it doesn't mean two men or males so get that thought out of your head but some translations of the bible say two men like the old kjv says two men but later versions of the bible realize okay people are going to run away with this in the wrong direction so it's two humans two persons all right uh um so this is uh that's what's what's going on but the point is that there are contrasts one is taken and one is left and whether we and we're going to get into the idea that is the one taken in judgment and the other one left for blessing and and uh, rescue or is it the one that's taken in rescue and the other one that's left for judgment there's some different opinions that go back and forth i'll tell you what my opinion is eventually we're still painting this broad picture where when yeshua is describing his return all of humanity falls into two camps. One camp that is clueless, that is in the dark, that's children of the darkness, that knows not the day or the hour, that is carrying on as business as usual, and they will be judged. They will be uh, eventually sent off into destruction. There's some more parables we're going to look at where um, the wicked are likened to uh, plants that are known as tares that are um, gathered together and thrown into the fire. There's another analogy that we're going to look at here in a moment where the wicked are likened to fish that are not good. When you're out fishing, you drop this big net of, of fish and there's some good fish and there's some bad stuff, bad fish, and you throw the bad stuff back out into the ocean, but you keep the good stuff. So there are different parables that give us the same picture of a separation. Eventually, if we were to continue through Matthew 25, he gives us the separation of the sheep and the goats and the sheep are the blessed on the right hand and the goats are the wicked on the left hand and the sheep go into the kingdom and inherit the the kingdom prepared for the righteous and the goats inherit judgment so either way it's the same picture over and over again of this separation from of good from bad there's no in between kind of people where you're riding the fence going well you know i'm not quite good but i'm not quite bad it doesn't work that way all right let's look now at the parallel passage in um uh uh, uh let me look at the there we go mark uh 13 real quick and then we'll jump backwards into uh and then we'll look at luke and then we'll jump backwards into matthew to for some more details but i want to read the parallel passages first so in mark 13 uh speaking of things to come i backed up to the beginning of the the, the chapter where um we can see that this is a question from his disciples about the temple and then yeshua goes into this idea about well all of these things are gonna uh, these stones are gonna be thrown down and he's gonna be talking about all the what we call the beginnings of birth pangs in this chapter i'm just kind of scrolling through it you can kind of scan with your eyes i'm not reading on purpose um but notice he's giving events that will give those who are in the light those who are true believers those who are faithful servants of god enough warning to know that events are preceding the monumentous event known as the day of the lord which is also the um which will precede the second coming of the lord so um in other words the day of the lord is judgment but the day of the lord is also the rescue <clears throat> of the righteous and the establishment of the kingdom of god eventually so the um, uh, uh, details that we're looking at right here are, have already been read over in uh, Matthew chapter 24, which is why I'm just going through them somewhat quickly. You can see uh, this is the parallel account. But what I want to um, jump down to is starting in verse 
14, which is the midpoint of the week, Yeshua says, right, the midpoint of the 70, 70 year, the seven years. Now, when you see the abomination of desolation standing where it should not be, let the reader understand. I'm starting in verse 14 of Mark 13. Then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. Verse 15, whoever is on the hill, to, hill housetop must not go down and nor to get nor go in to get anything out of this house. And whoever's in the field must not turn back to get his cloak. And then he starts talking about the same details that we just read about in, in uh, Matthew. But woe to those women who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. Moreover, pray that it will not happen in winter. For those days will be such a time of tribulation has not occurred since the beginning of the creation, which God created until now and never will again. Which is odd. Again, does that sound like business as usual to you? Well, certainly not for Israel, all right? And yet, Yeshua says, you know, people will be eating and drinking, get marrying and giving marriage, and it was just like it was in the days of Noah, right up until the day. So, on the one hand, there'll be, yeah, business as usual in the world, and yet, on the other hand, all hell will be breaking loose around everybody. And then, starting in verse 20, and if the Lord had not shortened those days, which days? Daniel says there'll be 1260 days for the Antichrist reign, 1290 days before the Antichrist is destroyed, and then another 1335. Let me pull up the little chart uh, to make sure I'm getting the time frames there. Uh, 1335 days until the rule of Christ is set up. And yet Yeshua says, if those days had not been shortened, Daniel's prophecy makes nonsense if Yeshua says, I'm just going to shorten everything. If it's not really three and a half years of the second half of the week, if it's not really a full seven years, like a tribulation model, if Yeshua shortens either the 1260, the 1290, or the 1335, then why even give those details to Daniel? Okay, we can reconcile this seeming contradiction. Actually, if we go back to, where's one of the other charts? If we go back and look at this chart, we can see it's three and a half for three and a half for the overview of the seven, and then cut right down the middle is the abomination of desolation that is just read about. That's the midpoint, and yet right on the chart, the next event that takes place is the Great Tribulation. And then reading from left to right, from the blue to the yellow, the Great Tribulation is cut short by what? The Day of the Lord Commencement. So that, which is also um, the uh, rapture slash resurrection, that is the cutting short, where Yeshua says, unless those days were cut short. What? are the those days what's that what are the those days that he's referring to i believe he's referring to the great tribulation which is cut short in other words it's interrupted by the day of the lord which commences which transitions from what we would describe as the wrath of satan in the great tribulation wrath of the antichrist wrath of satan in the great tribulation trans uh, uh which um transforms into or it's cut short by the day of the lord the rapture of the second coming the rapture i'm sorry the uh rapture resurrection which then transitions into the day of the lord which is the wrath of god so that's why yeshua said those days would be cut short so um so uh unless those unless the lord had not shortened those days i.e the days of tribulation um, not the days of the 70th week itself, but just the tribulation itself. No life would have been saved, but for the sake of the elect, which is Israel, uh, on, the, uh, on the natural end, but Christians on the spiritual end. But for the sake of the elect whom he chose, he shortened the days. And then, verse 21, if anyone says to you, look, here's the Christ, or there he is, do not believe it, for false Christ and false prophets will rise and will provide signs and wonders in order to mislead, if possible, the elect. But be aware, I've told you everything in advance. And then, I'm going to skip past a little bit of this uh, dialogue here. I thought it was right at the point where I wanted it to, but I was wrong. Um, it's actually starting down in verse 28. Now, learn the parable from the fig tree. Again, You've got to look at these parables, and there's quite a number of them. We've got the parable of the fig tree. We've got the parable of the ten virgins. We've got the parable of the um, uh, the the owner of the vineyard. We've got the parable of the um, Noah's as it was in the days of Noah, which isn't really a parable. It's it's a reference back to a a um, a, um, a story. But the point is, all of these are given to help us understand that. On the one hand, we've got wicked humanity that is clueless as to what's going on. And on the other hand, we should have faithful, um, the faithful elect who should be not clueless. Uh, they should be in the know. They should be watching the warnings. They should be looking at the signs. They should be um, aware of the urgency of the hour. Now learn the parable from the fig tree. As soon as its branches become tender and sprouts its leaves, you know the summer is near. By the way, he didn't say that um, based on a parable of a fig tree, you'll know that summer is imminent. 
rather he knows that summer is near we say imminent imminency up to a point yeah and we'll talk about this when we get to rapture later on but yes at some point in time imminence imminency will kick in when but only after all the other previous events have unfolded so you too verse 29 when you see these things happening recognize he is near right at the door then verse 29 is imminency right he's right at the door truly i say to you this generation will not pass away until all these things take place verse 31 heaven and earth will pass away but my words will not pass away but about that day or hour no one knows not even the angels in heaven nor the son but the father alone and then we have this parable about the um man who's on a journey and uh the uh, and also another parable about um uh, uh people having um uh, a thief break in if they'd have known when the when the thief was coming they would have been alert and uh they wouldn't have allowed the thief to break in so all of these parables kind of point in the same direction about be ready but it's the world at large that isn't going to be ready because they don't hear the voice of god but by contrast we who are his true followers should hear his voice so that's the end of mark's parallel now let me jump over real quick to matthew 13. he's got this parallel that he gives not at the same time as the olivet discourse that we read about in matthew 25 and mark 13 and luke 17 and 21 instead it's a a parable that's given to uh his disciples and the crowds in general but it fits in with the theme of the second coming of christ his return notices this is starting in matthew 13 starting verse 36 then he left the crowds and went into the house he just gave this parable about the weeds of the, this parable of the sower and weeds or are um, i'm sorry um seed is uh, sown by a sower and part falls one place and then another part falls another place and then this enemy comes and sows tares or weeds among the wheat so that both end up growing up together and so that's i don't want to read down through the parable it's earlier up in the chapter i just want to read where yeshua gives the uh, interpretation to his disciples remember we also have a separation here whenever he's talking to the crowds and in, in general he speaks in parables and like when he speaks to the pharisees he gives these parables that confuse them because they don't have ears to hear and eyes to see they're in stubborn rebellion they don't really want another truth even though they ask questions of you should like when are you going to when's the kingdom going to come and he just says the kingdom's not going to come in signs that you're going to be able to tell it's the kingdom's in your heart right this is earlier in this particular chapter as well i believe and so he kind of he kind of leaves them in confusion mode because of the hardness of their heart. But when the disciples turn to him and say, "Lord, tell us what this means," he tells them, and he tells them why. It's because you've been um, selected, you've been chosen to know the secrets of the kingdom. To you, it's been given these um, th- this privilege because your hearts are in tune with my voice, and you hear my voice, and you listen, and you follow after me. Therefore, I'm going to tell you. The, ex- the meanings of these parables but otherwise to everyone else who doesn't have an ear to ear and eyes to see they're just going to get the parables and they're going to walk away scratching their heads so yeshua breaks down the parable starting at verse 36 then he left the crowds and went into the house and his disciples came to him and said explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field and he does he says the one who sows the good seed is the son of man meaning yeshua and the field is the world and as for the good seed those are uh, these are the sons of the kingdom and the weeds are the sons of the evil one verse 39 um and the enemy who sowed them let's uh, go like this so you can guys see where i'm going and the enemy who sowed them is the devil and the harvest is you ready for it the end of the age and the reapers are the angels so we know the context now is the same slice of history that we're examining in our own studies which is eschatology the end time events and then he says in verse 40 so just as the weeds are gathered up and burned with fire it's the wicked so shall it be at the end of the age the son of man will send forth his angels and they will gather out of his kingdom all stumbling blocks and those who commit lawlessness and they will be thrown into the furnace of fire and in that place yeshua says there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth so they're they're thrown into hell basically then he says the righteous will shine forth like the sun in the kingdom of their father the one who has ears let him hear so um he goes on to talk about another parable about the kingdoms like a hidden treasure the kingdoms like a costly pearl the kingdoms like a dragnet and we'll look at this dragnet one um 
as well. Just real quick, this one. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet which was cast into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. Notice you bring up all these fish, but not all of them are good. Verse 48, and when it was filled, they pulled it up on the beach, speaking of this net, and they sat down and did what? Gathered the good fish into containers, but the bad they threw away. So it will be at the when? End of the age. Same time frame as what we just read earlier. The angels will come forth and remove the wicked from among the righteous, and then they will, th- and, and they will throw them in the furnace, and in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So, um, uh, uh, those are the end of the parables that I want to highlight. Now, where, where am I going with us looking at these parables and looking at how is it relevant for our Matthew passage? Well, going back to Matthew, where he's talking about that um, there will be uh, uh, two in the field, one will be taken, one will be left, two grinding the mill, one will be taken left. We're simply talking about a separation of the good from the bad. Eventually, what I want to get into, and I, I realize I'm running out of time to do it tonight, so I'll just give you a little bit of a teaser. We're going to talk about this idea, who is left and who is taken. I've heard, and I've seen this on the internet all over the place, it's in YouTube videos, that when Yeshua said, for just as it was in the days of Noah before they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving a marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark, and they did not understand until the flood, you ready for this? Took them all away. Because Yeshua says in the English, took them all away, which is Matthew 24, 39. And this word took shows up the same way in most versions. Although um, I um, turned over to the Matthew and the Mark. Um, Did I read the... Uh, Here we go. I didn't read the Luke passage. So let's take the last three minutes and read this. In the Matthew passage... He says in verse 39, and they, speaking of the wicked people, they didn't understand until the flood came and took them all away. And then in verse 40, he says, two men will be in the field, one will be, let me highlight it here, taken, and one will be left. And then in verse 41, it says, two women will be grinding the mill, and one will be taken, and one will be left. So three times in the English, we have from verse 39, 40, and 41, we have some variants some uh um some version of the word take or taken or something to effect and so i've heard bible teachers say this is proof from verse 39 that the taken are not the righteous but the taken are instead are the wicked because in the example with noah it is the wicked who are said to be taken in judgment and therefore, the righteous are ones that are remaining, right? Noah and his family, they are the ones that are left behind, whereas the wicked are taken in judgment. And therefore, using that context, in verse 40 and 41, when he says two people will be in the field, one will be taken, these same Bible teachers go on to say that the taken one is the one taken in judgment, and the one left behind is the one who's the righteous and the two and women at the mill the one taken is the one taken in judgment and the one left behind is the one left in uh ble- left for blessing and for uh to inherit the kingdom and i thought about that and it seems like that's a pretty solid case when you take it in the english but we run into problems when we look at the greek and we also run into problems when we look at the parallel passage in luke in the english so let's turn to that for a second this will we won't finish this tonight second coming foretold um Starting in verse 20 of Luke 17, uh, right here. Now he was questioned by the Pharisees. So this time it's not by the disciples. He's questioned by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God was coming. And notice, because of the hardness of the heart, and because he he can sense that many times they're asking trap questions they don't really want to know. Um, he he says, the kingdom of God is not coming with signs that can be observed. <laughs> and yet, in reality, it, it is coming with signs that can be observed. But he he gives them a cryptic answer because they're not really ready to hear the truth anyway. He just leaves them in the dark. It can't. It's not coming with signs that can be observed. And the the, the idea is that how can Yeshua be right here and yet be right when he talks about disciples and talks about all these signs and the coming kingdom? It's because there's two aspects to the kingdom. There's the physical kingdom that is going to be um, returning with the thousand-year millennial reign of Christ. That's the physical kingdom. But along with that, and maybe even more importantly, as he, and he tells this part, at least to the Pharisees, there's a spiritual kingdom. And he says it in, in the final half, he says, The kingdom of God is not coming with signs that can be observed. Verse 21, Nor will they say, Look, here it is, or there it is. For behold, were you ready for it? The kingdom of God is in your midst. 
meaning it's in you. It's here. I'm the kingdom of God, and my disciples and my followers, we're the kingdom. We make up the kingdom. The kingdom is right here, and he's the one talking to you. The king of the kingdom is right in front of your face. It, they didn't see it because of their hardness of heart. So there's the physical kingdom that will be seen with observable signs, but then there's the spiritual kingdom, which didn't come with signs in the way that they were looking for it. So that's kind of a side note. But in uh, closing to our study, um, he talks about to the uh, uh, disciples, and we'll read this and we'll, we'll leave off and leave it off with a cliffhanger tonight. He says to disciples in verse 22, the days will come. Um, let me let me scroll past this. Let me start in verse um, 26 there for sake of time. And just as it happened in the days of Noah, so here's our parallel with the Matthew passage. Just as it happened in the days of Noah, so it will be in the days of the Son of Man. People were eating, they were drinking, Yeshua says, they were marrying, and they were being given in marriage. So he's describing the general affairs of the day of people not being aware that there's this impending judgment. Right until, same, pass, same uh, details, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all. Did you catch it? Earlier in Matthew said the flood came and took them all away, using the verb took. But here it doesn't use the word took. It says the flood came and destroyed them all. So it's a different verb, but it's the same judgment. That it's the wicked who are being um, judged, but it simply says the flood came and destroyed them. So we can't build this case on the word took just because it shows up in the English in Matthew, because the word took for Noah is not mentioned in the Luke passage. And then he goes on to give an, an, an accept, second example. Well, you know what? I'm not going to read that one. Let's stop right there, verse 28, because he's going to give another analogy about Lot. And it's again, it's a separation from the of the wicked from the righteous. And we're going to begin to see, and I'll tip my hand just a little bit, we're going to begin to see that God can and does rescue the righteous from the area of destruction and yet pours out that judgment on the wicked by not rescuing in them from the location that the judgment is being poured out. That's a bit of a clue as to what he means by taken and left. And we don't have to get tripped up by the English words taken like they show up in Matthew 25. But we'll stop there. We'll pick this up again next week. Where we're we're um, uh, trying to understand this idea of the, the beginning of the day of the Lord. So I'll give you one uh, chart again real quick. Let's find it. Um, this chart works for me. The blue parts on your chart are the... Um, wickedness of humanity is poured out um, on just the general sense of humans um, judgment that is uh, in the sense of the beginnings of birth pains at the first three and a half year part of the 70th week and then as we tip over into the midpoint the great tribulation kicks off where it's the wrath of Satan the intense hatred of the Antichrist against Jewish people and believers and that commences at the beginning of the second half of the week but that is interrupted by the wrath of God that's poured out not just on humanity but is poured out on the Antichrist beast kingdom. So there is a stark difference between the wrath of Satan and the wrath of God. And there should be because of the um, recipients of who receives the wrath, but also because of whose wrath is being identified. So that's what we're talking about, about this separation what happens to the righteous? Are they supernaturally preserved during the wrath of God, or are they taken out of harm's way before the wrath of God is poured out? We'll begin to turn to those topics next week, but that'll do it for eschatology, a biblical study of end-time events. These are the live internet studies brought to you week after week by myself, Ariel Ben Lyman Hanavi, I'm a torture to your congregation, K. Latunavada the Harvest in uh, Thornton, Colorado. Find us online at graftedin.com and join us in, in person for our live Sabbath services. But if you're not able to join us, at least as I mentioned, join us online and um, you can see the link to the video right there on my screen as well.
these uh, live internet studies are a part of my own um, Torah teaching ministry, which parks itself on the web at tetzetorah.com. That's T-E-T-Z-E-T-O-R-A-H.com. I'd love to have you join me at my own home uh, personal website there and uh, browse around and take a look through all the uh, commentaries that you see on my screen right now as well. I also have a YouTube channel that I'd be delighted if you uh, popped in and um, took a look around there as well. YouTube.com forward slash C forward slash Tate Torah Ministries. If you do hit my website, uh, my YouTube channel there, be sure to uh, take notice that I update the uh, site essentially daily, uploading videos daily. Make sure then to subscribe, hit the bell for notifications, leave thumbs up for all the videos that you like. Um, leave me some comments and questions about things you have um, uh, your own thoughts on. And be sure to share the content with your other friends and family members in your social media circles, okay? Just some brief important uh, details. If you'd like to join us for our live studies, be sure to get access to Skype somehow. If you're on my website right now, um, uh, during the live study and you click on that blue Skype link, it'll actually open up Skype in your browser and you can just join us right there. And we hope you can join us live because we engage in a live Q&A after the study is over, opening up the microphones and it's exclusively to the um, uh, live studies um, uh, that we uh, enjoy engage in that live study uh, Q&A. But if not, um, take one last moment to scroll to the very bottom of my website where you can see some Hebrew writing and the black section down there and uh, prayerfully consider partnering with me to take the Torah around the world uh, in this particular format. You can click on the little yellow donate button and um, bless me that way with your uh, financial gifts and contributions and I'm so uh, blessed to be able to be in a place where I can receive uh, your generous gifts. Uh, thank you to all of those who have given in the past and are continuing to give. I'm so uh, thrilled to be on the receiving end of of your generosity and as i always say be blessed as you seek to be a blessing to others let's turn to a trinitarian response to biblical unitarianism my name is ariel ben lyman hanavi this last 30 minutes of our study is given over to looking at issues re, uh, related to trinity and understanding the nature of god and the nature of our messiah yeshua as well as the nature of the holy spirit and we're looking specifically at proverbs 8 23, I wisdom was appointed from eternity from the beginning. I'll read the entire passage here in a moment. But first, I want you to see that this is a look at biblicalunitarian.com's website and the biblical unitarian understanding of who Jesus is in light of this passage here in Proverbs. Is Jesus the wisdom that is that is uh, spoken about in the book of Proverbs? The biblical unitarian says, well, not exactly. They say that this is a personification of wisdom, which does doesn't have to be equated with Jesus himself. Remember, the biblical Unitarian position, which is non-Trinitarian, believes that there is only one God and he is the father of Jesus the human. He is Yahweh spoken of in the Bible. He's the father in the New Testament. He is the very God. He's the only one and true God. And he's numerically one with himself. There are no three persons of this God. There's no God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. There's just God the God. There's Yahweh God, and He's the only God there is. And Jesus, by contrast, is a human being that was brought into the world in the first century. He was not created by God in eternity past. He was not created by God before the creation of the world or anything like that. He was brought into existence from the mind of God into the world through the birth process that we all go through, except for Adam and Eve, of course. And therefore, he's a mere human, but he was exalted by God and glorified by God after his uh, death and resurrection. He was glorified by God and exalted to sit at the right hand of God. And thus, in this position, he is worthy of worship by humans, not because he's God, but because he is the chosen Messiah of God to sit at the right hand of God, the exclusive Messiah brought into the picture to save all humanity that uh, calls upon his name for salvation. So they get the salvation part right as far as I can tell, but when it comes to understanding the nature of God, they strip Jesus of his divinity and downgrade him to being a mere human. They, they, they believe in what we would call a low Christology. Uh, by way of uh, filling out the rest of the picture when it comes to Trinity, they believe that the Spirit of God is either a, another name for God Himself, God being pure Spirit, and God is holy, therefore God is Holy Spirit. So it's another description of God in the Bible. That's what they would call the Holy Spirit. That's simply God, meaning the, the numerically one being who's 
only the who's the only god that's the holy spirit or holy spirit is another way to describe the power and anointing that god bestows upon humans uh so that we can walk in the power of god but it's kind of a force from god it's an impersonal force uh, much like jehovah's witnesses it's not the uh, person of god that comes into our hearts it is the power from god uh in that regard so that's more or less their perspective of um what the trinity entails of course i'm a trinitarian i'm a biblical trinitarian i reject biblical unitarianism but i'm having these dialogues with my imaginary biblical unitarian partner here um so that a believer so that we can work through these issues so let me read the passage um in full uh it is this one right here the lord possessed me at the beginning of his way before his works of old um verse 22 verse 23 says from everlasting i was established from the beginning from the earliest times of the earth verse 24 says when there were no depths i was brought forth when there were no springs abounding with water and then verse 25 i suppose i didn't have to go back to 22 before the mountains were settled before the hill i was brought forth and what we've noticed uh when we uh yeah i do i did want to go back to 22 what we are noticing when we look at some of these words in the english is that when i pull up the uh hebrew um of verse 22 um the the the, uh, the uh, proverbist uses some peculiar verbs that correspond to the english verbs you know brought forth uh created or um uh, existed or um established and um we've been examining them like like uh in this verse it would be um this word right here um adonai kanini rishit darko um kedem mi pa mi pa live me at uh i was and if i hover over the word it tells me i was possessed of god of yahweh at the beginning in this one um me olam nisakti me rush me kad me aretz aretz um uh, this word right here uh, at the beginning nisakti I have been established um, before the what did it say in the English when there were no depths I was brought forth when there were no springs abounding with water um, in the Hebrew it says I was brought forth and it's this see if I can catch it without doing there it's this word here cholalti um, uh, is the, the the verb that I'm looking for I was brought forth by God um, and then even in the uh, verse 25 before the mountains were sailed before the hills i was uh brought forth it's the same uh word down at the bottom there can i catch it uh hard to grab because of the way this web page has these little um hot corners um cholalti has shown up again and so zoom back out so the point that we've been making is that i've been borrowing a little bit of the terminology from psalm chapter 2 i believe it's verse 7 where yeshua uh god speaks of this um exalted messianic king who was begotten of god and so that's where i'm picking up some of the notes just by way of um of reference from the greek there are certain words that were borrowed from the hebrew that are also relevant in the greek um, not all of the words show up in the greek translation we look up the looked at the hebrew word kanini here which is possessed which corresponds to ektisin in the greek down here below kurias ektisin me arke hadon autu ace erga autu he established me before the time in the beginning um the lord uh created me the greek has created ictisen which is a little odd right did he create wisdom did god lack wisdom that he had to create it and then use this as a tool to create the universe so this is why from the hebrew he has the english being possessed uh kanini but in the greek we have let me just highlight it for you so you can see right there kurias ektisen is the lord kudios and ektisin is um, created which sounds kind of odd or established is how it's translated um in the english uh, translation there i was set up from everlasting we already looked at the hebrew there um nasakti but um this verse 23 in the septuagint doesn't have a verb that i can sense uh before the eternity uh to lay a foundation um me in the beginning it, it it's by context but there's not actually a, a corresponding verb uh when we get to verse 24 when there were no depths i was brought forth when there were no fountains abounding with water uh 
Let's see. Before, uh, in the English translation from the Greek, before the mountains were settled and before all hills, he begets me. But when I um, look at the um, Greeks, I'm just hovering over some of the words. Uh, if I remember, once again, the verbal form of what we saw earlier for um, this one right here, cholalti, in the Hebrew, doesn't have a corresponding Greek word. But when we get to verse 25, before the mountains were settled, before the hills was before the hill the hills was i br uh, i'm sorry before the hills was i brought forth i think he's got a typo there um we have uh Cholalti there and this time we do have a uh, a corresponding um greek word um pratu um hore edras thenai uh pra de panton bunon gena me this word right there gena is the verb to beget and so the corresponding english should be something like the lord made countries and uninhabited tracts and the highest uninhabited parts of the world see the the um the uh wording really belongs here before the mountains were settled before all the hills he begets me so um the uh, uh verb that i'm just highlighting which corresponds to the hebrew of there cholalti is paralleled finally down here as uh genna and um why is this relevant for our particular study well we did this little exercise jumping through all of these words and then i'll just pick up a kind of a segue from where we were last week and read why i believed these were relevant so this is the paragraph before i ended last week thus i mentioned after looking at all these uh, hebrew and greek words thus the incarnational aspects of these two verses what two verses psalm 2 verse 7 where the the um chosen messianic king is described as begotten uh, today i the, you uh the, um you are my son today i've begotten thee if i scroll back up um uh to uh verse 27 of psalm god has a special relationship with this uh messianic king let me see here it is uh begotten today the you are my son today i've begotten thee um and we talked about how that the hebrew word uh yelitika, which is the uh, word for uh begetting or to get to bear forth is an eternal begetting it's not a kind of begetting that happens in the heavenlies where god gives birth to jesus but on earth it's the normal word for giving birth begetting and that's why we've been using that as the launching point for the uh, proverbs um, uh, uh, discussion about the, the wisdom did god give birth to wisdom the same way that humans give birth to other humans well yes but no so let's keep reading uh so in the incarnate the incarnational aspect of these two verses the one in psalms where god says that you are my son today i've begotten thee and then the one in verse 25 uh where uh you where he says um i was brought forth and we re, re use this hebrew word um uh cholalti um the force of those two words i describe in my uh notes here uh is that in the incarnational aspect they both point to jesus christ as the eternal word of god it's an eternal begetting so it's the idea that if you lose sight of this fact then you reject incarnation and you begin to misunderstand who jesus truly is god is the father of jesus and yet because jesus is the word which was with god and was god and because wisdom has always been one of god's attributes that god cannot dispose of he cannot discard he cannot lose he cannot be without otherwise he is not the all-wise god anymore right if he lacks wisdom and he somehow is not immutable because he changed when he created wisdom which he didn't have in the first place you understand my logic there so wisdom is an eternal part of god's attributes it's an eternal part of, part of god's um character and is an eternal, eternal part of his identity and just like wisdom is eternal with god then therefore using that same uh, uh, kind of uh sy symbology um or personification of jesus we can say that the same words that are spoken of wisdom being eternally uh, in god's possession or w dwelling with god or being a part of god's nature can be said of the word which was with god and yet was god fully divine from john's perspective john 1 1 
So the incarnational aspect of these two verses is that they both point to Jesus Christ as the eternal Word of God. He's the eternally begotten Son. He was never, there was never a point when he was not the Son of God. Therefore, there was never a time when God was not a Father. The Father is eternal, and the Son is eternal, in that the Father is an eternal Father. Therefore, the Son is an eternal Son. And therefore, begettal is simply eternally, eternally begotten, not like in the sense of humans where it's temporal, where one time we're here and the next, one time we're not here and the next time we are, uh, you know, we're brought into the existence. I go on to say that in John 1, 1, which we're going to, we're working our way towards, a verse that we will examine in greater detail below, Jesus is in fact referred to as the word which, ready for it, was with God in the beginning and was God. So this is our confirmation from the apostolic scriptures that let us know that John is given a revelation that was hidden from the Old Testament writers that the Son of God, who was born in the first century, predated his own first century birth. He predated his existence. And yet Yeshua can speak of it as, as if it's just common knowledge. He talks to, for instance, Nicodemus, a ruler of the people, and he said, you know, you must be born again. And But earlier on, he talks about how that I am from above, the one who's from above. No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended. Wait a minute, Yeshua. What do you mean you descended? Where were you before? Well, obviously, he must have been in heaven. He came from heaven and came down to earth. He came from the part where he was with God and descended down into earth during the incarnation. And yet he tells Nicodemus, saying, no one's been into heaven except the one who descended. No one has ascended except the one who descended, meaning no one has gone up into heaven at this point in time. And later on, he talks in other places about, um, you know, if I... Uh, I, I'm going to I'm going to return to the Father. I'm going back to where I came from. He tells the disciples, right? I'm going to go back to be with the Father. And um, he tells other people again in other times that um, you know no one has come down from heaven except the Son of Man. The true bread come down from heaven, right? No one has gone up into heaven. Only the true bread who comes down from heaven. So in no uncertain terms, Yeshua relates himself with being that one who came down from heaven. This means it's not just a mere thought in God's head that came down to heaven, from heaven to earth. Yeshua describes it as if it's full person, uh, personality, for full personhood that came down from heaven. He's a, he's a person, although at the incarnation, his nature changed, right? He went from being full uh, deity to now having a dual nature, which is humanity as well. But he didn't lose his divinity, he just veiled it. So I go on to say in my notes here, thus with Proverbs chapter 8 providing the antecedent theology to the incarnational belief that we believe in, that we hold to as Trinitarians, um, Trinitarians can confidently assert that the word of John's letter is indeed the personification of wisdom, which is okay. The Trinitarian, the um, Biblical Unitarian simply relegates Jesus merely to personification, and they relegate the word in John 1 1 merely as a thought that existed alongside God in the form of just that thought. So, where was the word of God before he was incarnated, like we read about in John 1 1? Well, he wasn't really a he. In the sense that he's a person, instead, in the non-Trinitarian model, according to the uh, biblical Unitarians, which are ancient, which are um, the um, followers after, or they're the what would you say, the offspring of the early Socinians, they believe that Jesus is a mere human and he existed in the mind of God from eternity past. God knew that that Jesus would one day come into the world as a as a man, but. He wasn't in existence in eternity past, nor was his existence at the beginning of God's creation. By contrast, by the way, and you guys have heard this before, the ancient Aryans, who are known today by their uh, more common title, Jehovah's Witnesses, they believe that Jesus did predate his birth in Bethlehem, although they don't believe he is eternal. Instead, his beginning was when God created him as a thing, as a construct, as an ob, as a, a creature at the beginning, and then God used that creature to create the rest of the world, the rest of the universe. So all of creation of creation springs forth from Jesus as the agent of creation, but because Jesus is the first thing that that God created, and then Jesus went on to create everything else. So um, 
somehow Jesus created all other things instead of all things because he couldn't create himself. God created Jesus and then Jesus created everything else, all other things. And they even alter the wording of the New Testament to fit that theology, which I soundly reject. So going back to my notes, um, speaking of John's letter and the, the personification of wisdom, which was present before the creation of the world. So I'm not holding to any such Aryan theology where Jesus is a creature that was created by God and then used by God to create the rest of the world. No, Jesus is the very creator. We looked at this graphic that I'll put on the screen again. You can't see it in post-production because it's not in front of you, but it will show up on the video. It's a graphic where there's this um, sky blue uh, line running vertically from top to bottom of the screen and on the left side it says god in cap all caps and on the right side it says everything else and under the label god on the left side of the chart that i'm describing for you is the titles god the father god the son god the holy spirit that's god all three persons are god co-equal consubstantial and yet three persons one god yet three persons one what three who's according to dr james white's way of uh, describing things that's on the left side of the screen left side of the, this chart i'm describing the right side of the chart has everything else and that is simply that just that everything else all of creation so jesus is on the god side because he is creator god and yet Yahweh is creator God, and yet God the Father is creator God, and yet Jesus the Son is not the Father. So Jesus is God, then the Father is God, and yet Jesus is not, and yet the Son is not the Father, and the Holy Spirit is not the Son, etc. etc. It's that little uh, Trinity shield you've seen all flashes on the screen also in post, uh, where we've got the arrows chasing each other to show that um, the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God, and the arrows are pointing to each other, and yet inside as you shrink down into the shield the the father is not the son and the son is not the holy spirit and the holy spirit is not the father so it's that um, kind of that tension uh created by the nature of god and the persons of god let's keep reading my uh, notes here to be sure in because this is just review in colossians 1 15 to 17 paul describes jesus as the image of the invisible god the firstborn over all creation and the one through whom all things were created so it's it's not wrong to call jesus the agent of creation because at the same time, while he's agent of creation, he is also the creator. He, he, he wears both titles. He is both creator and the agent of creation. Just like he is both the high priest and the sacrifice at the same time. And every Christian that uh, has studied through the book of Hebrews and correlated it with the book of Leviticus understands the concept that I just mentioned. Jesus is is the type and shadow of the perfect sacrifice in the in the old testament economy in the tanakh and yet at the same time when we get to the book of hebrews we find out that he's the high priest well how can the high priest also be the sacrifice how can the sacrifice sacrifice himself how can the high priest be the sacrifice right you have to um be aware of the uh, both roles that jesus is playing as high priest and eternal sacrifice what's well, the same concept he is the the creator and he is the agent of creation he's both at the same time all right so let's keep reading to wit if jesus identity is that of creator viz agent of creation then this means categorically just like my chart had earlier he cannot be part of the created order rendering the ancient heretical Arian, as well as Socinian claims incompatible, and this is my poke at them, incompatible with the authoritative New Testament writings and Trinitarian Christology. So in my chart, or in my saying there, Arian is known today as the Jehovah's Witnesses. They're the most, um, one of the most famous Arian Christian outfits out there. And the Socinians are today known by the name of the uh, Biblical Unitarians. So now let's keep reading uh, through my own notes here. Um, so in summary, that's where we left off last week, the terms begotten in Psalm 2-7 and brought forth in Proverbs 8-25 describe, as I say, the relationship between God and his creation, while the former refers to the special relationship between God and the prophesied messianic king of Israel, so that's um, brought forth 
the latter, i.e., um, he established me or brought for, brought me forth. The latter describes the emergence of wisdom from God, meaning God God's attributes issue forth from Him in such a way that it does not deplete who He is, and it doesn't require that God create them before they can be issued forth. I'll give you an example: the word that god used in the book of genesis at the very beginning when it says in the beginning god created the heavens and the earth the earth was unformed and void darkness was on the surface of deep and the spirit of god hovered over the surface of the waters and then the very next verse says and god said let there be light so in this three verses of genesis we have a few things happening we have the elohim which is the which is god at the very beginning right bara elohim in the beginning god and then it talks about how that the ruach elohim the ruach elohim the the spirit of god hovered over the surface of the waters well, this is the Spirit of God issuing forth from the Elohim of God. So we have the, the Ruach Elohim going forth from the Elohim. But did the initial Elohim become depleted? Did God have to create the Ruach in order for it to issue forth from him? No, because God is pure spirit. And the Spirit of God can go forth from God the Spirit and not um, deplete or... or uh, uh, reduce the amount of the original uh, source, which is the Elohim in the passage that I'm referring to. And then, uh, right on the heels of that, in verse 3, it says, Vayomer Elohim Yehi Or Vayehi Or, and God said, Let there be light, and there was light. Well, God speaks, and this word comes out of God's mouth. Question Did that word need to be created by God before it could come forth out of his mouth? Was it not inside of God? Was it not a part of God and the very essence and nature of who God was? Was not that part of God eternally with God? And yet, it becomes a separate part when it comes forth out of the mouth of God to um, create the, the first element of creation, which is the light part after the, the overview of creating the heavens and the earth. God said, let there be light, and there was light. God said, why did he even have to say it? is the point I'm trying to make as well. If God is Almighty God, and He is, couldn't He have just thought light into existence? Yes, He could. And God thought there was light, and there was light, right? It could come forth from thinking. But the metaphor that Moses was given by God is that there's something that comes out of God that is a tangible, separate aspect of God, and yet in the same time is very God. It's one with God, and yet is with God. Right now, I'm speaking into a microphone in front of me on my desk. The words that are coming out of my mouth are a separate component of Ariel himself. The words have um, reality. Um, they exist in the form of sound waves, and they, they hit the microphone, and they turn into sound, and they're recorded, and all of that. And so the point I'm trying to make in my crude analogy with myself is that they initially exist in my head. But until they come out of my mouth, no one around me can be as aware of them because I don't have a way of, of conveying them. They need this, that they need to be brought forth out of my mouth in order for you guys listening to even know that they're there. And God does the same thing. In essence, the word comes out of his mouth, and then the rest of creation is witness to this word that comes out from God and yet is God and yet is brought forth. And so that's the force of the word that I'm trying to describe here in the Proverbs. God says of wisdom, I brought it forth. It describes the emergence of wisdom from God. Both terms I say in my notes are used to describe the pre-existence of their subjects, indicating the their divine nature. And we're wrapping up tonight. This will be a kind of a shorter study. We've only got three minutes left in um, my study here. And then we'll, um, we'll wrap things up. The Hebrew and Greek words that are used in these verses, and I butchered the, the Greek earlier, so I apologize. Uh, those used further emphasize, I say, the correlation between them, highlighting the importance of understanding the original language of the Bible. And um, I say that because if we simply just go with the English and say, well, we got a translation that says before, like for instance, um, when I go back to verse uh, 22, the Lord possessed me at the beginning of his way, speaking of wisdom. Verse 23, from everlasting, I was established. And then verse 24, when there were no depths, I was brought forth. And then he use, he repeats the brought forth word, um, the hulalti in um, 
uh, uh, verse 25, but in some translations of verse 23, like the uh, Biblical Unitarian, um, nope, it's not their version. There are some versions that have that use the language of I was created at the beginning. Let me see if I can find it in one of the ones that I've got sitting on my screen. Verse 22, in this rendering, Yahweh possessed me at the beginning. Verse 22, verse 23, I was set up. Uh, verse 24, I was brought forth. And then 25 is going to say brought forth again. But some versions of either 22, 23, 24, or 25 have, um, have God uh, creating. And so, um, let me just... Uh, I won't do it right now, but to, to, trust me, I'll find it uh, next time. I apologize for not showing you which one it is. Um, I go on to say in my notes, uh, ultimately, these verses point to Jesus Christ as the, this is my opinion, as the eternal word of God who was present before the creation of the world and through whom all things were created. And then, so let me read the conclusion to this section where we're uh, dealing with just the Hebrew and Greek highlights. And then we are going to turn to John 1, 1 a little more um, more pointedly to draw in the parallels between the wisdom of God in Proverbs and the word of God in John. So I say in conclusion to this uh, first section of my essay, I maintain that the Trinitarian interpretation of Proverbs 8.23 is the most faithful to the text and the context. The verse clearly states that wisdom was created by God. And I use the word created there just because that's the way it shows up in some other versions. And the words that are utilized, the verbs that are utilized, it's not wrong in some nuances to use the word created. So that's why I left it in my little essay here. It states that wisdom was created by God, right? So it's a bit of a kind of a, a playing on words there. But it also suggests, because there's a nuance there where created is used, but it also suggests that wisdom is in a unique relationship to him. And what is that unique relationship? Wisdom is one of those attributes of God that God possessed at the very beginning in order for God to be all wise and to at the same time be immutable. God doesn't change. And yet at the same time, when we're talking about the incarnation of God, then there was a miraculous event that allowed for the eternal word of God to take on humanity, something that never existed in the economy or what we might call the godhead uh the godhead prior to that so i mean did god change well in his nature no but the incarnation represents the bringing in of the humanity alongside of the pre-existing uh divinity right remember john 1 1 says in the beginning was the word the word was with god and was god and when we say was god if it's a predicate nominative we're talking about um the idea that deity is being ascribed to god all that the word was all that god was the word was or james white often says in the beginning was the word the word was with god and all that god was and the word was deity or the word was divine um full deity not just divine like the Jehovah's witness might say but full deity like uh, is suggested by the uh, the greek word there all right so in my um conclusion here i say that the new testament applies proverbs 8 23 to jesus christ which suggests that the son of god is the wisdom of god personified remember i also mentioned that this is only just one version of this view of the wisdom of god in trinitarian theology still puts him in high Christology. There are other Trinitarians who believe that Jesus is not wisdom personified. Instead, the book of Proverbs is simply just that. It is um, kind of a poetic personification of wisdom, but doesn't have to be actually Jesus that the book of Proverbs is referring to. To be sure, many Bible teachers point out that wisdom, the word chokhmah, which is the word wisdom in the Hebrew, is a feminine word grammatically feminine but this kind of makes it odd to think of jesus in the sense of feminine terminology so that kind of throws a lot of people off and i go on to say in the conclusion part moreover moreover the trinitarian interpretation is also supported by the original hebrew text of the verse uh we're speaking of basically proverbs 8 23 the verse as well as confirmed by the holy spirit inspired new testament teachings about the trinity so um the new testament part that's authoritative is the part that gives us the final say on the matter when in terms of 
uh, incarnation in terms of the identity of Jesus alongside of his father as very God, the in terms of there being a separate person of God known as the Son, yet at the same time, in essence, they share the same essence, the two persons, the three persons really, share the one essence, and therefore when we say God or Yahweh, it's almost like we're describing the class or category of this being that we call God, and yet when we look at the persons, we're talking about the roles and functions of the economy of God. It's the balance between, and I'll put a little chart on the screen in post-production, it's the balance between, on the one hand, the ontological nature of God that's balanced against the economic nature or the economic uh, identity of God. We have ontological identity and economic identity, or what we might call the ontological trinity. That's where God's nature is in focus, where ontology deals with the nature of a thing, a being, or a person, or a rock, or anything. Ontology just covers the nature. What is the thing composed of? What is it made of? So when we ask the question, what is God made up of? He's made up of the God stuff, right? He's made up of whatever is uniquely to him um, self-existing God, that which cannot be divided. It's indivisible. It's eternal. It is this homoousian in the Greek. It is um, uh, immutable, um, you know, unchangeable, uh, eternal that whatever which is beyond our understanding right we don't know how god can be this but he is and yet at the same time when we're talking about the persons of god and i'm closing with this we're talking about the persons of god father son holy spirit we're talking about how does god interact with human beings and in that interaction with his creation and uh the created order and the um might be called hierarchy of god there's the father over the son the son over the spirit or issues forth the spirit uh the spirit is dispatched from the son and the father as well but the the, the son directly answers to the father in terms of authority the father is above the son in the new testament model and throughout the scriptures the son answers to the father as as the one who sent me, the one who gives me the marching orders. You know, the, the father is like the commander in chief, and the son is the 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 um, primary uh, soldier that's that's dispatched by the father to do the father's bidding. So, in conclusion, here to my conclusion section, let us turn now. I say to examine some of the important parallels between wisdom of Proverbs chapter eight, between the wisdom I left out of the there and the logos in john chapter one so what we're going to do in this next section not tonight but we'll begin to look at the wisdom of proverbs and the logos of john and see how that john was given an authoritative uh, view or uh, insight into the word of god the logos of god and he must have been aware of the wisdom of God as already is, was presented in the book of Proverbs. But the parallels between the two are, are striking and they're, I believe, worth noticing. And so we'll turn to that next week. But um, let's see, are we going to meet next week? Yes, we will meet next week. I was a little debate on whether we should meet next week or not because it's actually New Year's uh, weekend. Just like this weekend is Christmas weekend and we're meeting anyway. So we will meet next weekend. I'm not going to take a break for Christmas or New Year's. Just be safe wherever you're going to be. If you're going to be with us, that's great. If if not, uh, if you're going to be with your families and friends and loved ones, that's that's fine. Just stay safe. But we will pick this up again next week. But that'll do it for Trinitarian Response to Biblical Unitarianism. Let's go in, in prayer. Abba, bless your name. And I am thankful to be in a place where I can study in order to do, in order to teach, which is basically the Ezra principle. I study your words so that I can be pleasing to you and do your will. But at the same time, in so studying and doing, I am put in a place where as a teacher, I can teach others to do the same thing, which is study in order to do, in order to teach. So thank you, Lord, for the responsibility as a teacher. And um, the insights that I'm shown from the text, I don't have perfect answers. I don't have all the answers, but to the degree that your word is trustable, reliable, complete, and authoritative um, in all of its aspects, then I, um, I look to your word as the final answer on all matters. And so thank you, for Lord, for preserving your word for us. I don't have always um, the, like I said, complete understanding. There are so many parts of your word that I'm just... Uh, um, 
just uh, uh, desiring to know more and more of it. So for that reason, I avail myself of it, just like we all should do. So help us to press in, help us continue to rely on the Holy Spirit because he's the author of the text and he's the one that's going to reveal things to us. Help us to continue to share our findings with others because that is our responsibility as teachers and as students of the word. Help us to have a, a sense of the urgency of the matter of the world around us to just it's in the dark they're clueless they don't know this good word they don't know this good news and so you have commissioned us to take this good news to those around us to share the gospel to share yeshua to share a witness and to be ambassadors of your kingdom what an awesome responsibility um strengthen us as we uh go throughout our day and look for opportunities to share uh the gospel with others around us continue to strengthen us and raise us up and uh keep us safe and uh bring us back together next week and we'll be careful to give you the praise and the glory but shame yeshua omen